actually does go live on my phone. Okay. It says we're live. You guys in the live stream, let me know if you can hear us and see us. That's always the big first thing. And then what we'll if go we from see? there. Normally there's an ad verse too that people have to watch. And then Shauna, Beth, and John, I assume that you guys can hear me and see me okay. There's no lagging or anything. No, yeah, no, you're, perfect. you're, yeah, okay. there's no lag at all. You guys sound good. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Yes, people can hear us and see us. Perfect. Um, so hello, everyone. It is good to see you today, or not see you physically, but see you in the <laughs> chat. Um, today, we are kind of going through something different. We've never walked through this before. Um, we actually got, Sean and Beth, you might remember at the April conference, we got some questions and concerns about inflation and rising yes. fee costs. And how do you, you know, combat that? What if you can't find feed various questions like that? And so in our HOA community group on Facebook, um, someone posted a very long post and I'll go through it in just a second, basically addressing inflation and how do you keep a sustainable homestead with rising gas prices? You know, how do you fill your tractor? That's really expensive, you know, rising hay prices if you're not cutting your own hay. Um, food shortages, because as we all know, homesteading is such a broad range. You have, you know, the home center who's doing it all, who is, you know, growing their own food. They have livestock. They're trying really hard not to go to the store. And then we have homesteaders that are trying to figure out how do I start sourcing more locally and I don't want my food supply to come from the grocery store, which is one of the biggest reasons I have John on because he has a really super cool co-op that he can talk about too. Um, you know, how do I find people in the area that I can depend on? And so um, as we go through this live stream, you guys are welcome to ask your questions in the live chat. Um, it's just going to be a candid conversation. And we do have some questions to get started. Let me pull this up on my phone. Um, okay. I'm just going to read this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It was, uh, pretty long, but so, um, so she says, uh, this commenter says, for example, she's looking, she's not necessarily looking for prepping though. We can talk about that as well in this conversation. Um, but how do you make your home sustainable? So ensuring that based on the expenses of what it costs to raise and keep animals, especially on a small scale basis, what do you do to ensure you have enough chicken and pork and beef? So that was her, her first thing, you know, a lot of homesteaders are getting into raising their own livestock, but how do you actually know how much you're going to need, you know, for the year to sustain your family? And then for her, another example she had was, so you buy chicks, raise them to chickens, you get a rooster, have fertilized eggs, incubate your own chicken eggs, feed those chickens your food scraps, free range, et cetera. That's a great way to be sustainable. But how do you, how do you get to that point? How do you prepare for that? Um, and then she's looking for an explanation from experienced farmers and homesteaders who live off of what they raise. So how much does it take to get there? And essentially how much is it costing you? Um, how, basically she needs for it to make sense to those who aren't there yet, but badly want to be sustainable. So that's the first part of the question. How do you, how do we get to a point where we feel really comfortable and we're working towards this sustainable homestead, even without inflation and all of that? Like, how do you get started this year right now? If this is the first time you're, you're starting, but then the second half of the question is how do you maintain that? So if you're already an experienced homesteader, if you are already doing all of this, um, but you're seeing $7 a gallon in California for gas. And, um, I know a lot of people are having issues this year with, um, buying hay with graze on, on it. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. That's been a really big issue. So it's killed their gardens and it's killed all kinds of things. And, um, and then how do you, how do you maintain this sustainability on your homestead, doing it all. And in those situations where everything just kind of falls apart. So 
That's a loaded question <laughs> <laughs> on both sides. So let's start with the smaller homesteader type thing first. So people are wondering, just like in 2020, everything blew up. And I can't tell you how many phone calls I had of people asking me if I had chickens for sale because they couldn't find chickens and they couldn't find eggs and they couldn't find anything. So, um, becoming sustainable is a big deal. So what I'm going to ask each one of you to kind of elaborate on, uh, what are your first steps suggestions to getting started to become a sustainable homestead, whether it has to do with food shortages or inflation or not, just where do you start? Um, that's, that's a big question for a lot of people because it's overwhelming. Do you start with a garden? Do you get a milk cow? Do you get everything or, or how does it work? Um, and then go from there. What, what we always start with is what does your farm provide? What does your land provide before yeah. it's ever a farm? Yeah, before it's ever a farm. So the things that we would look at are you could you could forage, you know, you could find things, mushrooms, things like that. But what your what your land is providing is a lot of grass. Um, and that grass is food for some animal. And we don't mean just grass, we mean whatever is growing on your farm. We do a lot of uh, farm consults and people bring us in and they say, well, I know our pasture's terrible and stuff like that. And we get there and we say, no, this pasture's great it's for the right animal. It's fabulous. And if you have a lot of briars and stuff like that, you can start with goats. Uh, if you have just forbs, you could go with sheep. If you have more grass, you can go with cows. Uh, but ultimately, if you're taking care of your, pro of your land, if you're taking care of your pastures well, and by that we would mean rotationally grazing, putting animals on an area for a, sh a, a short amount of time and then moving them around, grass will really start to come in and take over. And then you can move to what we would strongly recommend is a lactating cow. Uh, what we love about the lactating cow is it's twice a day harvest all year round. We don't know of any other animal, garden, plant, anything that gives you this perfect food twice a day, every day. And uh, it's, it, it feeds everything on the farm. You want to elaborate there? Well, I, I was. <laughs> or, or move to John. I, I, right. I was going to, I was going to see what John threw in there. I totally agree with you in the sense of if there's one thing and only one thing you could have a family dairy cow, yeah. if you have pasture is the, you know, it's the ultimate return on investment. Yeah. Once you get caring for that animal down. Yeah. And, and we, we would even say that maybe even if you don't have pasture, I mean, I know that there are places in Europe where the cow stays in the barn almost all the time and they just keep feeding it. hay. and we would say even that, is worth doing worth doing that the cow giving you milk is just uh, it, again it feeds everything on the farm it's easy to store uh you can have cheese you know there's a great book out there um that was first published in 1880 and then republished in 1920 and i will come back to this site and post the name of it i don't remember it right now um that's i think 12 essays solicited by it was a part of an essay contest asking all of these town people write a write an essay about how you keep a single cow in town and why and it's brilliant it also makes you embarrassed for our present level of of writing and thinking poorly <laughs> but um i'll post it because it's worth looking at as an argument that yeah indeed you can keep a family cow as the source of not only your farm's food but its fertility even in in very small piece on very small pieces of land, even in town, but not maybe not maybe today. Nineteen twenty, yes, not today. You know, but John, that, what were you going to say? Yeah. Well, two two things. One is um, I had a friend who is a missionary in Mexico and South America. And he told me the story of how um, in some areas, people in the morning on their way to work would walk their cow, mm -hmm. and they would picket it. Yes, that's right. In the, in the grass between the roadways. That's right. And then the cow would graze in between the roadways. And then at lunchtime, they'd come and water the cow. And, you know, then on their way home from work, they'd pick up their, cow, you know, they'd move it to a new spot. Um, so it, it's amazing how resourceful people used to be with resources. That's right. That's right. So um, 
Simon Fairley, British farmer and journalist, talks about various countries in which that's the practice. He calls the old English term for verges and things just the long acre, meaning that if you take a skinny piece, if it's long enough, you still have enough land for your cow. And um, he points out that people who don't own land are still, via animals, non-landowners are still able to transform default forage. And we're when Sean and I talk about pasture meat, we mean whatever is growing there um, to transform that into the highest quality protein, fats, and sugar so that you know even an impoverished culture has access to the best foods. I mean, Little House on the Prairie, all of those, that's, they survived on the milk cow. And um, we, as we were looking back and saying, how did grandpa used to farm before there were feed stores? How, how did this happen? Um, this was one of the, and, and this has kind of been our mission since we've been farming is how do we not go to the feed store? And the milk cow is the center, that and rotational grazing are the center. And, and one of the things uh, that uh, Amy talking, you know, we, we would start with the milk cow. We would not start with chickens. We would not start with a pig. We would start with the milk cow because it's going to be bringing that food in. And very soon after you've got the milk cow, now I need a pig because and I've got chickens. so much milk coming and chickens that I've got so much, but now I've got the feed to feed those other animals. And instead of doing the corporate farming method on the tiny, which is what most books out there suggest that we do. Uh, the bot feed method. Yeah, the bot feed method. This, this is a, you know, we start with the dairy cow and then we move out from the dairy cow to feed the other animals and to feed us. Awesome. Yeah, you guys talk about that a lot at our events too, which is awesome, right. which, which brings me to the next question. <laughs> There's a couple of things. First, the first question is, okay, that's great, but how do you feed the milk cow? Somebody's going to ask that. And Beth actually just wrote uh, a good blog post for us about feeding animals on homegrown um, forage. But then someone else also had a question saying, what is your opinion on mini versus full-size dairy cows? An example, mini Dexter or mini Jersey, or what would you suggest? Um, so... I mean, we're tempted to think mini is going to be easier, partly because we think she'll make less milk and that'll be easier for us. And partly because we think diminutive size makes an animal easier to keep. Anybody who's ever kept goats, sheep, and cows will tell you that cows are by far and away the easiest. They're easiest to fence. They're the easiest to keep healthy. They're the easiest to milk. Um, they're the easiest to consider children to drink the milk. So dairy cows are, are really easy. The thing I would warn people about with minis is that anytime you move into specialty breed or specialty size, you have just diminished your possible breeding stock by a ton. Like I could, if I needed to go next door to the, you know, neighbor's Hereford bull and say, can your, can you book your bull cover my cow? Because although our Jersey Dex crosses are small, they're not tiny. They could, they could, um, birth a calf from that Hereford bull. If I had a mini, that wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. And I, it doesn't matter how beautiful, how pedigree, how agreeable your mini is. If you can't get her pregnant, then she's not going to give you milk. So that's, I'm, that's part of where I'm coming from on the minis. Um, there ha the number of available breeding sires is even small, let alone local, right? The number available on the planet is small enough that you can begin to be moving into an inbreeding situation. Um, to refer back to the question of feeding animals, yes. the thing that makes um, the grazed animal, the dairy animal, so absolutely basic and foundational to human agricultural systems is that they can take the 99% of your sunlight that you're not catching in your garden, right? And turning into tomatoes, they can take that 99% of the sunlight on your farm and they can turn it into proteins, fats, and sugars, meat, milk, and manure. They can feed you 
feed your animals and feed your soil. And they don't need anything else. No, people who tell you that you have to grain an animal, a grain a cow are, are that's are mistaken. inaccurate. Right, you uh, might have, you might have no... a boutique cow that has right. been raised up to think that she needs grain. And you might have trouble flipping her. Although we've moved many a grain cow onto all grass successfully. But um, in, you know, when the Lord made them and we haven't successfully changed that very much, they are cellulose digesting animals not carbohydrate digesting animals primarily. So they, the, only, the only natural gramivores are insects because grain has a very short season in the year and you have to be something that can become dormant or be an egg for the whole life cycle, you know, until you restart your life cycle at the next harvest season. So cows don't need grain. And, and then, the, then the trick becomes, how can I feed my animal grass all year round? And uh, what we've been doing is doing a lot of experimentation with stockpiled forage. So here in Appalachia, uh, we are uh, central Ohio, just on the border with West Virginia. We only have to uh, use hay three weeks out of the year. That's an average. It just depends on the weather. When there's snow with ice on top of it, the cow can't nose her way through the snow to the grass. So we feed hay then. But the rest of the year, she's eating either grass with no snow on it because we don't have snow or grass through snow. So you have an animal that is eating for free all year round and is giving you two harvests a day all year round. It's it's kind of a no brainer. And that's a potential two harvest. It's not like you keeping a grass right. dairy cow. You are not tied to this relentless twice a day, always at the same time milking schedule. That relentless schedule is the is the it's the the property of the commercial dairy farmer who's trying to produce a whole lot of milk, and so he's got a cow who's always just so full she's on the verge of mastitis, or or already there. Okay. Um, so I know the question will be asked. I think it was even asked earlier uh, in some of the comments. So a lot of homesteaders. Um, and I had this conversation with someone recently, they are not necessarily, they're getting livestock that's maybe a little too much for their property. So, you know, they're taking a milk cow and they're putting it on an acre or whatever. And so they have to feed hay um, in the, in the wintertime. And so, um, you know, with, I don't know how much hay is around there for round bales, but it's increasingly going yeah. up around here. Like our farmers here are saying they're expecting it to be 80 to a hundred dollars a bale come fall. And so, um, and that's Virginia, Virginia is mm -hmm. expensive. So, um, the, the next question would be if I, if you have to feed hay, you know, if you're trying to make it work on this small property, um, is, is the, outcome from your cow worth it? You know, are, are uh -huh. you paying more than you should be? And then the second question is how do you go about, you know, storing up? What if you don't have the room to store up? What are some ways to barter or to work with a farmer or what, what would people, what would you suggest people do who are trying to do it on a small property, but maybe don't have access to, um, storage of hay or, or rotating pasture all year long? Uh, one, one thing that I would suggest is that uh, most people uh, within five minutes of where you are, there's land available that nobody's doing anything with. And that would be one of the first things I would do. So we have a convent up the road, a mile and a half. They were not doing anything with their property. We approached them and said, would you mind if we started taking hay off of your property? And they were fine with that. But gradually we work toward, would you mind if there were cows up here? Uh, and they were a little bit concerned. These are city girls. Uh, but it was uh, uh, when, the, when the Reverend Mother said to me, Sean, we like the smell of cows. Uh, we knew we were in. Um, but it was a matter of looking at land around you and saying, is there land that's not being used? And, and that's a really great solution uh, for either leasing or bartering or uh, exchanging um, some meat for something like that. I think that those are really good uh, things to think about. What are prices like down where you are, John? For hay, uh -huh. I think we're probably at 35 around bale. 
Yeah, so. we're we're up around forty and four for squares. But for the like, for the question, is it worth it? An easy way to throw that one in the scale is say you've got this cow three sixty five, and in that three hundred sixty five days of the year, she's going to probably out. You know, you can just figure out what's her average production over three sixty five, multiply those gallons times whatever value you're going to assign a gallon of milk. You could give it $10 if you were selling it to somebody who wants raw milk. You could give it $10 if that's what you're presently paying for raw milk. You could call it four if you buy it at Walmart. It doesn't matter, but multiply that times the number of gallons you're going to get a year and then throw in the value of a calf that she's going to raise for me. And we're going to assign that calf a nice low pound. We're going to pretend you have to butcher it um, at, you know, 400 pounds. So you're going to realize maybe, maybe 175 pounds wrapped weight and the value of meat, maybe at what's meat going for right now. I mean, like people are telling me average 10 bucks a pound. That sounds really high to me, but even if we assigned it five, so now we take the value of the milk, the value of the meat from the calf that's only cost us his milk for the year. Right. And then we subtract from that. Well, we have fertility. Four dollars a day for a square bale, right? For December, January, February, March, maybe April, we'll give it five months. It's easy to show that monetarily you're coming out way ahead, right? Even if you're spending four dollars a day to feed that cow December through through April, you're coming out way ahead. Okay. All right, one more cow question because we could talk about cows for forever. <laughs> I know, I know, we could. Um, so someone said we're looking at small scale silage as a potential winter feed, based on the book "All Flesh Is Grass." Apparently, it's common in third world countries to mix silage in fifty five gallon drums. Is this a good option, or is that Gene Logston's "All Flesh Is Grass"? Or do you know? I have no idea. He just said all flesh is grass. I don't, I don't remember that in there, but um, we, we've looked into and done a little small scale silage. I wouldn't do it for cows because cows don't require silage. I might do it for hogs because they like being drunk and they enjoy things that are, you know, they enjoy foods in many different conditions, right? Whereas a cow typically doesn't get exposure to fermented leaves. Um, it's, I mean, if you happen to own a chipper shredder and you have a lot of um, heavy duty plastic bags or, or metal cans, it's an, it's an interesting and exciting experiment and well worth doing. Um, but there are easier, there are just less labor intensive ways to feed both cows and pigs in the winter time. And we can talk about those if you want to, but um, you know, si yeah, silage you is a little bit labor intensive. Through. I know you, um, a lot of people had questions about um, the beets that you guys right. grow. Right. Um, we don't have to go too in depth, but you can give some examples so people can look into them. So what are some of the things that you guys grow? Um, and then the next question after that, which will lead us into some more animal questions um, is uh, someone's thinking about asking their neighbor if they can use their 50 plus acres. Yep. Uh, to rent and she's never done that before he has never done that before um how can i expect to pay you know what like what's a ballpark figure of pain and then if you lease land for hay how do you harvest hay without having big machinery so those were two big questions after that uh, those are big questions um i'm i'm trying i'm gonna answer them backwards see if i can remember them john do you, i don't want to jump into this one if you already have more experience with like hand making hay than we do um, I have some, uh -huh. so, you know, I have a bunch of friends who also hand do hay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, you know, depending on the location, the land and truck, you know, other infrastructure. I mean, one easy solution in my area, if you don't have the equipment to do hay and physically or otherwise, you don't want to do it yourself is doing a hay share with a farmer, um, you know, on, on the road back to our homestead, there's probably 20 tractors owned along this road that 10 of them are probably used three times a year. Right. Um, and so in some areas, it's, you know, I, when I, whenever I've ran the numbers, it's way more affordable for me to pay somebody to do hay for me. Mm -hmm. 
as long as they can do it in a timely fashion, which everybody knows that's sometimes a problem when you're paying yep. to have yep. pay down. Um, or to do a hay share, especially on land that if you're leasing land at an affordable mm-hmm. rate, mm-hmm. having another farmer who needs more hay and has the equipment and already does hay, you pay the lease and then you split the hay, they take off the land and everybody's happy. Do you have any idea what, what the um, rate per acre for cropland for hay land or for grazing land is in your area? Uh, in our area, my hunch is it's probably 25 to 45 dollars per, per year per, per acre. acre. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that people have no clue. In in our area, it's between 15 and It's 30. like 10 to 20, right? It's We're paying very 15. inexpensive to lease land because... Yeah. Uh, it depends on the land. Crop right. land's, crop more, land's expensive, more expensive, hay land's more expensive, grazing land's the least expensive. That's right. And it's very inexpensive to do that. And again, you could do something where what we do with the sisters is, I mean, we, we know what it is that we would owe them in money and we end up do, uh, doing an exchange with meat. So we give them a milk. cow, mm-hmm. milk, milk and, and meat. milk right. and meat so that we'll give them a cow or a pig. Yeah, but our ca- yeah. I, I just want to be clear to all your listeners. So we rent... 30 acres at 15 bucks an acre a year. So $450 is what we owe the convent for that, for that pasture. That is not paid for with a steer or a pig. We <laughs> give the steer and the pig <laughs> as a gift yeah. and a very valuable gift. We pay that rent actually in milk and that milk is calculated at $10 per gallon. So we give them 45 gallons of milk over the course of the year, actually more, but that way we know we've remunerated. I wouldn't want anybody out there to think, I want to rent a pasture. I'm going to have to raise an animal for the, for the owner. Yeah. Do not overpay for your pasture rental. Um, the value of pasture land, especially poor pasture land, which is frankly, folks, all anybody's going to be willing to let you on anyway, right? They're using their good pasture themselves or their neighbors are. their good pasture, I'm, by which I mean, it's been planted to pasture species. They imagine that it's gonna make their animals grow bigger, fatter, faster, cheaper, as Joel would say. So um, the value of that is higher, but the, the native and naturalized pastures, those things that look like vacant lots that you all think that's not a pasture, it won't, sur- you know, it won't support an animal. Many of those will, and they will rent cheaply. Um, Oh, about hand making hay too, that I wanted to say. That's beautiful. And there are some great methods like um, ricking and using hay tripods and using hay fences. And people have been making hay for thousands of years in a lot of different ways. And they had some very simple tools to do it with. And you can certainly do that. But until the day comes that most of us can spend most of our times time on our farms and homesteads, because that's where our principal life support is coming from until that moment making hay by hand for more than one animal is a big job it's a very big job it's a really big job and it's a beautiful job it's it's scything is restful work it's not fraught with all the tension of a big hay making but you'll spend a lot of days on it we we used to do hay with a large tractor uh and and uh and a baler baler and uh, it was miserable. <laughs> he hates, we, uh, yes, he hates the it anxiety break down. that was caused because uh, we knew it wasn't going to rain for five days and two and a half days in it started raining. Um, it was one thing after another. Plus the equipment was old equipment and we would end up spending as much money on uh, fixing the equipment as it would cost to just buy our hay in. And again, the key is not needing hay. Yeah. And that's, that's what, the best thing. Right. And so what we've worked very hard is, okay, well, how can we not need hay? So we do buy hay in, but it is primarily as a backup in case we have the ice on top of the snow. And yeah. usually we do for about three weeks out of the year. Uh, but, but the, the other thing to, uh, I don't know if where we were in those questions, but one thing that happens when you start rotating animals and taking care of animals and pastures that way, all of this is going to improve. There was some question, how do we sustain our farms? Uh, we always say that the family has to come first, then the pasture must come second. So you do not overstock, you take care of your pastures and every year, and we started with some of the absolute worst land in Ohio. 
every year it is improving. And that's absolutely true that your God obviously created a system where if you do it, if you follow his method, everything gets better. So we have an abundance and then the, 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 the pastures improve. And uh, yeah, we, we are. Re- relative to the, to the question about if you haven't got hay storage, here's one thing you can do. Um, you need to make contact with somebody who's making hay, the kind of bales you want, round or square, big squares, little squares, big rounds, little rounds. And then talk to him about buying hay at, at the present rate. And that means you're paying for it now, but you're locking down a certain number of bales, which he will then store for you for the winter, right? And you, so you come pick it up over time and you'll end up paying something for that because he's got a fee attached to the fact that he's got to put it away, like move it. You're not taking it out of the field for him and a fee attached to the fact that he's storing it. But like the guy who makes, we buy hay from a man up the road and I know he holds hay for several horse people and he charges them an extra buck and a half or something on the bale, but they're paying, say they're paying 550 for a four dollar bale right now. It's going to be stored for them. It's going to be kept out of the weather, and they're not going to wonder, will I be able to find hay in January? They're not going to wonder what's the price going to be in January if they have the the cash to lock it down right now. Yeah. Well, and I always tell people one of the most important things you can add to your homestead is a lean-to off a building for storage. Mm -hmm. It's so cheap square foot wise. Absolutely. Now in a real pinch, if you need a way to store hay or straw and you don't have true covered storage, uh, we've done this many years. Um, We can get free pallets out where we are Mm -hmm. from the local construction place. We'll put two pallets on top of each other. Exactly. You can stack square bales, you can stack round bales, and then you just double tarp them. That's right. 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 Um, And obviously you might need to put some organic um, mouse poison in there just to keep it from becoming a mouse den. Um, Because, you know, Big Hay House is a lovely place for animals like mice to take up residence. Um, So you might need to think about mice traps or other things to control some pests. Uh, but, but you don't technically need a building to That's store right. hay or straw well and, and to keep its quality very high, especially if the hay you're getting is properly dried. It's also true that a round, ba- I mean, when round bales were invented, which I am old enough to remember, round bales are stored outside. And we all knew, okay, so the outer three inches is going to be very low quality grass. But the hay inside, which has been sheltered by the thatching of the outer hay, is still perfectly good. You lose some some food value, but you gain it back in the form of organic matter on the soil, in the form of I didn't have to figure out how I was going to store it. I didn't pay as much for outside kept bales. So that's worth doing too. Yep. Okay. So other than hay, that was good because we had a lot of hay questions, people wondering about that. Um, Let's, let's go into other ways to feed animals, no, not necessarily just cows, but um, people are, one, someone just asked, please address the roots that Sean and Beth are famous for using and other fodder options. So uh, about animals in general, um, and John, you'll probably have some stuff to say about this too, just with like leftover produce, maybe from your co-op or whatnot. Um, what are ways that people can feed their livestock other than regular chicken feed, grain, hay, right. all of that stuff. So, so what we're, talking are, about what non, we're talking about non-ruminants now, because I'm not w- willing to admit that any ruminant requires anything other than <laughs> forage. So yeah. although you can feed the things that we raise for our animals to cows, sheep, and goats, we don't, right? Every once in a while, the cows break into the mangle pouch and they'll eat the mangles right down to the ground, but I don't offer them those things. Um, principal crops that we raise for feed. And I guess this is a good time to say, there are four things we want in in an animal feed crop. It has to be easy to grow, by which we mean the cultivation of the thing is easy, but also that it has few pests and problems. I'm not gonna work that hard for this, right? This is not about how do I work myself into an early grave? So it has to be easy to grow. It has to produce hugely. It has to store passively. I'm not gonna have a freezer for this. I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna freeze dry it. I'm not gonna, 
none of that. It's got to store passively somehow in just a dedicated space. And it has to feed out without processing because I don't want to cook dinner for my dinner. So all of these crops are going to fall into that heading somewhere. Number one, mangle wurzels. Um, and Amy has some posts about this. The mangle yep. wurzel is just a beet. It's exactly the same genus and species as the Detroit dark reds you raised for your table, but it happens to be about this big. It's gigantic. They can get to be 10, 20 pounds. 20 pounds is what you'll see in the literature. I think that's perfect conditions, but we regularly see 10 pound mangle wurzels. Um, since every mangle wurzel is actually, you know, like about this big around and about this tall, they don't take up tons of space and they're not hard to harvest because most of that's above ground. You just rock them back and forth and lift and they're harvested. Um, they store in a root cellar. So anywhere that you can keep them from drying out, seeing the sun or getting warm, they're fine or freezing. corner of the basement or freezing if you're in a cold climate, which we are. So we have a root cellar and they just get, we shove them in old feed sacks that our neighbor saves for us and shove them in the, in the basement, in the root cellar. And they we're, we still have some right now because we haven't finished feeding them out and they are sound. They are not soft withered or anything else. They're just sound roots. Um, pigs love them. Chickens love them. Um, I would warn against substituting one for one, even on the, on a dry matter basis for something like a grain with chickens, only because a chicken's crop and its gizzard ha have a limited size. Chickens actually do live on sort of concentrated foods because they live on seeds and insects largely. And so they don't have the huge belly that a, a, a cow or a pig would have to hold wet foods but is a perfectly good um, energy and vitamin food for chickens. It's terrific pig food. So we can grow you know, a ton or more on a 10th of an acre, which is about 50 by 75 feet. It um, depends on how close you put your rows together, but that would be like a 10 or 11, uh, 10 or 11 row patch. So I'm looking at five feet times 10, 750 row feet of mangles can produce you a ton of mangles. That's going to go a long way to feeding a pig all winter. They are not difficult to grow. Um, we cultivate two or three times. This year was difficult. This year, the patterns of rains on our clay soil gave us imperfect germination, which is normal with beets anyway. So we've had to put a bit more work into the crop. But I do want people to think, I'm not trading. If, if we propose to feed our animals home-raised feeds, but the flip side of that is we're putting just egregious amounts of labor into it. We might as well go to work and do our paid job and get paid you know, a decent hourly wage and then see if we can pay somebody else to, buy, to raise our pig food. Really, it would still be worth raising your pig food for the sake of food security and food safety, but it is kind of hard to undertake. So that's the mango wurzel. All the other crops are going to fall into the same easy to grow, pr produce a lot. And, and mango wurzel, I mean, you can't just feed your pigs mango wurzels. You have to give them protein. You have to give them other things. More and fiber. that could come from table scraps. Uh, we have our own table scraps that we give to the animals. We also get the scraps from the sisters at the convent. So, at the convent. so that's something that we uh, regularly can feed uh, our pigs. And I, I would suggest to anyone, uh, Talk to your neighbors, uh, you know, uh, prevent things from going to the landfills and see is, you know, do you have table scraps? And then again, you might be able to barter for something, but all of the milk scrap is a primary uh, source for protein for our pigs. Uh, we don't want to buy pig feed. So we're looking for all of those sources where we can have pigs and when we run out and and everything goes through the pig pen so weeds from the garden uh you, you know if we're cutting grass and we want to we can throw that in there anything can go through there so anything that would have normally gone into the compost bin goes through the pigs first and then it goes to the compost bin and um there's another thought i had and i so milk's the me. game changer yep um thomas shaw who wrote a book in the in the early 1800s, late 19, or early 19, late 1800, and early 1900, somewhere in there, wrote a book called um, Feeding Farm Animals, maybe. And he, sa he starts out by saying, only a fool keeps a pig who doesn't already have food for it. 
meaning that the proposition, when you take an animal, they can eat um, what we would call waste, meaning stuff that we wouldn't consume either because it's surplus or because it's in a condition we wouldn't want to eat. When you take an animal that will turn that into sound flesh and instead you feed it food that's human, human appropriate, you're making, you know, like you're just throwing your work away. That was his point. But one thing that he took for granted was that homesteads were already harvesting their grass through ruminants and they were getting a daily harvest by milking that animal. And in an age when there was no refrigeration and everybody kept a cow, you didn't attach a cash value to your surplus milk. You fed it to the omnivorous animals on the farm who needed high quality animal fats and proteins that were not gonna be in their plant foods. In other words, simply put, spare milk goes to the pigs and chickens. And, and, and that was the other thought that I had lost was that when you run out of pig feed, you butcher the animal. Um, you, don't con you don't then start feeding it feed to do that. But in order to be able to do that, especially we're uh, around here, the butchers that are butchering are a year out to get a date. So you have to learn how to butcher your animals. And although that seems intimidating and scary and everything like that, it is not. Uh, you don't, pork chops don't have to look exactly like pork chops. <laughs> I mean, you cut it up in a way that you can use it. And if you grind it, it's wonderful. Uh, we're so intimidated. We're so afraid of doing things that we perceive are unsafe. And I think as a culture, we've got to start turning that around and recognizing that that is not what our grandfathers did. Uncle Sam wasn't shoving a thermometer into the beef that our great grandfathers were ha had hanging in the barn, and they and they were fine, you know. Um, so plants that you can grow. Any of your long storage winter squashes are great pig food. So what grows for you? What grows for us is a heritage squash called Tromboncino. Knows no pests, produces enormous amounts of squash. It has a great bonus, which any animal food you grow should have if you can arrange it. And that it's people food. So as long as I have, as long as there's plenty of food, I feed plenty of squash and mangles and so forth to my pigs. But if there's ever a food shortage, say half the village shows up on the doorstep and needs to be fed. That hasn't happened yet. You can convert that. You can convert that potential animal food into people food, which is always important. Other crops, Jerusalem artichokes produce enormously require almost no labor except digging them. Um, like potatoes. the large striped sunflowers, potatoes, we grow a ton or more for us. And that leaves plenty of overage for the, for the animals. Kale is an easy one and it's a good milk crop. So if you have, I don't feed it to cows, but if you have a sow, say that is nursing piglets, that's a good crop. There, I'm, I'm missing something in here. Potatoes, mangles, squash, sunflowers. Corn, you do corn. Grow a little bit of corn. So we can't we can't, when we first started growing feed for our animals and we looked at the grain crops, we realized that's just beyond to grow it, to grow those crops on a scale that would feed animals is beyond our land capacity. It's beyond our tool capacity. It's just beyond us. Not just because it takes a lot, but because we live in the land of, we live in <clears> central <throat> Appalachia and there's a deer or a turkey under every rock and behind every blade of grass and they want your garden. So if you, local farmers told us, look, the first five to 10 acres of corn you plant is going to the deer and the turkeys. Well, okay, that's already way beyond what we can grow. So we grow a 10th of an acre of um, country gentleman, which is an old fashioned sweet slash field corn. We harvest some for us, but then that 10th of an acre cut whole stock and fed green before the deer and turkeys figure out it's there, before the raccoons raid it, fed to the pigs. That's like six weeks of pig food in the fall, right in that gap between summer, when we, you know, first we had a lot of milk and a lot of weeds, now it's dropping off, but the pigs are getting bigger and they need more. We feed them the corn and that fills the gap before fall comes, the grass starts to grow in. Again, the cows are giving more milk, the mangles are ready, the squash is ready. So those are all good animal feed crops. Remember, easy to grow, produces prodigiously, easy to store, feeds, feeds out without processing. 
and that that goes for all of those. Okay, John. So you have something to add? <laughs> yeah. So well, my next book, I started on this book about four or five years ago. Um, it's called Beyond the Bag. And it's all about strategies for minim getting the most out of the feed you do buy and minimizing your dependence on bot feed. Um, and and it's amazing how many options there are to, you know, to reduce. Um, what you have to purchase for your animals. Um, so one of the first things that I think people need to realize is we need to stop raising or carrying animals through the time of year that there's so little food. Uh, you know, there's a reason historically people butchered off almost everything in the late fall to early winter other than their breeding stock or, or their ruminants. Um, because it, it just, it doesn't make sense to carry your animals over winter. So people are always just like, you know, we raise a number of pigs every year, but since we don't farrow our own pigs, we get them from a really good friend. We always plan, hey, by, by December or early January, all the pigs have gone to freezer camp because it's expensive to provide for an animal, especially when you also have to heat them through what you feed them. You know, so the first thing I tell people is we need to readjust our animal raising to the, the, the natural system that provides food for them as efficiently and freely as possible, mm -hmm. um, unless there's, you know, something else. You know, the next thing um, to think about, especially, and, and, you know, this is one of the whole sections in the book is we've really focused on increasing um, the the free forage value of our ecosystem that our animals live in. Um, so one example is, you know, take chickweed or take hen's bit. Well, why are those named chickweed and hen's bit? Well, because they're, they're weeds to us that these animals have a, a really good proclivity towards eating. And then you look at their nutritional profile and like, wow, these, these have as much protein as soy. Um, which is super expensive and usually sprayed. So I've created areas on our farm that naturally just tremendous amounts of, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of chickweed and hen's bit grow. Um, so, so there's stuff like that you can do where you can plant lots and lots of comfrey. Um, there's a farmer, a friend of mine told me about out West where he planted alternating rows of hazelnuts and elderberries. And he raises, and then in between he has clover planted and they raise pigs in these clover alleys and the pigs are, and, you know, and they harvest some of the elderberry flowers and they harvest some of the hazelnuts, but now the pigs are getting berries and nuts and they're getting clover and it's tremendously reduced their reliance on having to buy feed for the pigs. Um, one of my favorite crops to grow, especially for pigs, is sweet potatoes. And sweet potatoes are a, um, uh, you know, in the South, you, you can go back reading historical agricultural literature for America to almost the earliest days. And peanuts and sweet potatoes were crops that were grown for people, but because harvest was much less efficient and thorough than it is now, the fields were always cleaned by pigs. Um, it, it, it was a major finishing crop in that gap um, that the Doherty's were talking about in between you know, early summer stuff and then there's this gap of milk. So um, there's a lot of crops you can grow, um, sweet potatoes being one of my favorite. Um, there's a forage pea, I think its name is Aversaca, um, that a number of farmers I know will grow paddocks of this forage pea um, because it's really, really prolific, very, very <laughs> heavy yielding. Um, and it, it also is a great way if you have a marginal piece of land or pasture where you're really like, this needs better organic matter, th this has some structural other problems, they'll fence it to an acre size, they'll plant it to this forage pea. And then when the forage pea is ready to harvest, they just let the pigs in and it's total self-harvest Going back to this idea, whatever we're doing to reduce our dependence on animal feed 
has to make labor and time sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. Exactly. I, I've seen some really amazing setups where like people are doing black soldier fly year round. But I, I look at like, that's totally amazing. But how does that make any sense in terms of now you've had to build this insulated temperature control, you know, yeah, sure. It's cool. But does it actually pencil out for you? Right. Um, you know, so one thing we raise is we do worm compost. Uh, we've been doing worm compost even when we lived in Louisville in an apartment. I was gorilla worm composting in the basement <laughs> of our apartment building. Um, and I love worms are my favorite homestead animal because they thrive on neglect. You know, nothing else on my homestead likes to be neglected except for my worms. Um, and so th there are some things you can do where the labor is minimal and the protein feed value is quite high. Um, so there's stuff like that you can do. Uh, when we bought our land, I've always joked, um, I was the first person ever to buy a farm, soil not included. Yes, right. Um, and I borrowed a tiller because I didn't know anything. And the tiller broke before my ground did. Because mm -hmm. uh, our ground was just so, so poor. We were like less than half a percent organic matter mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when we started on our land. And so I had to go up to Louisville once a week anyway. And I began to ask around. And, you know, like there's all these coffee shops that have coffee grounds. Mm -hmm. And all these coffee grounds are just going to the landfill. And there's a number of organic grocery stores that have expired dairy and produce that can no longer be sold, but it still has tremendous value as either animal feed or compost. Um, and so I have all these pictures of me and my older kids where we'd wake up at about four in the morning on a day <laughs> I had to go run my buying club. And before we went to the buying club, we would go buy three coffee shops and two grocery stores. And we would pick up about two to two and a half thousand pounds of pitch produce, dairy, and coffee grounds every Friday. Um, and then you bring that all home and some of that becomes feed value for your animals and some of that repairs your soil so you can grow more feed for your animals. And now you're running to and from town, um, bringing value both directions mm -hmm. rather than <laughs> running empty. Um, you know, so there, there's so many options for attacking, reducing feed reliance from improving how you manage your homestead and what it produces you know, um, take a pile of wood chips. If you just get a large pile of wood chips, and even if you don't add anything to it, but if you add a bit of coffee grounds and other stuff to it, it would produce the majority of protein for a small flock of chickens. If How you are you harvesting those worms, John? Oh, in our worm bins? No, no, oh. in, the, in the wood chip pile. Because, I mean, we grow tons and tons of big fat worms in the wood chip piles. Um, but the chickens generally only get down to a certain level. They can't move. You know, they're not like the pigs that are actually rooting. They're just disturbing mm -hmm. the top couple of inches. So what do you do? Just stir it up for them periodically? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, as part of our morning uh, chore routine, um, you just grab a shovel. And it obviously depends on the number of chickens you're trying to keep. But if you're only keeping a dozen or so chickens, um, when we walk through the compost field, it, it's literally just... Um, six, six quick deep shovels of mm -hmm. opening up spots mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there's breakfast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. John just um, mentioned something that's important. I think everybody get too. It goes back to that overstocking question, which is chickens are the most demanding of help being fed of any of the livestock we keep. People generally go straight to chickens when they homestead, not realizing that they are now experiencing the animal that's going to be the hardest for them to produce food for unless they follow the rule, you know, only a few chickens. If your household is at least half the number of chickens you have, right? So no more than twice, two chickens per one person in the household, the household probably produces the majority of the feed needed by those animals, just in the form of you know, the ends and bits and pieces of things, scraping off plates, if you let your kids do that, you know, banana peels and so forth. Um, but John, you said, if you're keeping a reasonable number of birds, yeah, like a dozen, not like 50. 
50, now you have to buy feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a lot. That's a lot of good information. <laughs> um, John, I like that you said sweet potatoes because sweet potatoes are a huge crop here in Virginia. And well, I remember... you could feed the greens. Um, you yeah. know, so th there's a number of really high protein greens um, that pigs especially like. So another thing we do, last thing I'll say, is you know most people view their garden and they have a tomato plant and around the tomato plant, it's the surface of the moon. Then they have another tomato plant and around that tomato and, and their whole goal during gardening season is to keep any other plant from getting near any other of their plants. Um, and so then people come, will we'll come to one of our homestead gardening classes, right? You know, and, and they'll be like, I can barely see your plants because there's so much clover everywhere. And, and, you know, so I have this beautiful picture of our high tunnel where it, it's a foot deep of clover, the entire floor of the high tunnel almost. And there's fennel growing in the clover and there's peppers growing in the clover and there's cucumbers. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm growing my nitrogen for my plants. I'm shading the soil. I'm improving the organic matter of my soil. The clover is super high protein. And so every morning when we walk through the tunnel, you just take a little hand sigh and two five gallon buckets. And in five minutes, I can harvest um, all of the protein needs for a pig for that day. Uh, you know, so there's so many easy strategies, especially at homestead scale, to maybe not completely get off buying animal feed, but to really significantly dent your overall dependence on it. Yeah. Okay. Let me, I've missed some questions here. Let's see. Um, hold on. Let me scroll up really quick. Sorry. Okay. So one, then, then from, from here, we're going to switch into like, uh, people who don't necessarily have a livestock to feed, but they want to be more sustainable in other ways. Um, so Jesse says, I have about a half acre to give to an additional meat source. We've thought about meat goats, lambs, or hogs, none of which we've done before. What would you recommend and what fence type should I get? A half acre for a meat source. Okay, so if you've got a half acre, presumably, I mean, you could look at a crop, but let's look at what's growing there first. Um, that's really the question, isn't it? You say, what's growing here and who eats that? Here, here's, here's one thing for people to keep in mind. In, uh, say on our pastures, which like John, we came to them and there was no organic matter. It was some of the most damaged so soil you can ima imagine. Um, and it hasn't greatly changed in its soil analysis, although it's greatly changed in what grows there and how it grows. Um, there are 70 cow days for a medium-sized lactating jersey in a single acre of our so-so pasture, which means there are 140 dry cow days, right? Standard animal unit for, for say you've got a Dexter or you've got um, a Jersey bull calf, you know, he's, he's eight months old and you put him out on pasture now, right? 140 days of grass on average in that one acre, and it's not a great pasture. So that half acre, if it's judiciously grazed with say a stalker calf, a partly grown calf, will actually carry you, given that you, you know, if, hoping that you don't get a, a drought this year, that'd carry that animal for three, four, even five rotations, depending on what you're doing, until he runs out of grass, at which point, like Sean says, you better learn how to butcher quick because you won't be able to get a date for him, right? <laughs> so that'd be an easy way to turn into protein. What would you use, John? Oh, I would, I'd get a meat cow, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, but, but again, if you have access to half an acre, um, you all said this earlier and it blessed my heart, like uh, all along my road are these little parcels of land, a lot of right. which now are finally being hayed. And you just be amazed at how much hay comes off a small parcel of land. 
how many round bales mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. easily. And, um, and, and so if you have half an acre, I'd say, see if you can find two more half acres to right. get hay from. And, and go. tether, you know, uh, that's the other thing is, well, I have to have all this fence. I have to do all that. Right. No, tether your animal and keep it moving. And uh, it's, it's a great way to, to control your animal. I want, we don't have time for it today. I would love to hear somebody teach on the equipment and because we've tried tethering cows in the past because mm -hmm. we have 35 acres um, and because of the layout of our farm, it, it would be super expensive to try and fence in any amount of this acreage. So I was like, oh, hey, we're going to try picketing our cows. And it went so-so. And so sometime I'd love to hear somebody who is familiar with the equipment for picketing and tethering cows or a company to come up with good modern equipment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because our cows would get wrapped around a tree and then you're like, oh, what are you, you know? And right. Um, yeah, so, but, a lot of tethering is in the, in the arrangement, right? Not just the equipment, but like knowing never let animals cross their lines, never leave a, an animal where she can hang herself. Yeah. Bad idea. Um, put the water at the furthest extreme of the tether so they can't knock the bucket over things of that kind. You know, a lot of it is just in, in management. That sounds like a good topic <clears throat> for HOA conference. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you your next talk. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to move. I've had you for an hour, <clears throat> believe it or not. So you guys are going to have to let me know um, how long you wanted to be on here today. I won't go more than another half hour um, just because my we're pregnant we're, body we're, is We're like, good. We're enjoying this very much. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So just, just holler if you need to go, um, let's switch into, so we've, we've gone through the, I think the feed conversation was one of the biggest ones. Like how do I feed my farm, um, with, you know, rising costs with feed shortages, with all of this stuff, which you guys did a really great job of answering. So now we're switching to the homesteaders who maybe don't have a pig to feed. They don't have a milk cow, but they do have a garden. They have chickens. Uh, maybe they have a goats or something. Um, but the question for that was, okay, I see this change in our economy. I see what's happening. Um, you know, I already have a few things going on. Maybe they don't have enough room to do the milk cow and the pigs and, and being sustainable in that way. Um, what's your suggestion? What, what is, what are your recommendations starting now? So people, are really eager to start now so that when winter time comes, you know, there's this, there's this fear of a very long winter, you know, um, people are concerned. We had in our HOA group, um, someone posted the other day saying that the electric company is turning their electric off every afternoon, um, for hours at a time, uh, against their wishes and they can't do anything about it. You know, what's it going to look like in the, in the winter time, you know, are they going to, keep turning their electric off. The grid can't keep up, you know, and all of these things. And so they're looking for ways to be sustainable in, um, you know, how do I shorten my supply chain? Uh, what are my options for that? How do I bypass the grocery store, but I don't have a sustainable homestead? Um, obviously food preservation is hu huge, but if your power is out for six hours a day, you know, what, <laughs> what do you do? So um, there's a lot of concern around that. And not even so much as, as inflation, but just how do homesteaders who can't do it all become more sustainable in the way that they live um, with taking advantage of other homesteaders in the area or um, different types of co-ops and things like that? Yeah. One of the things that we say with gardens, and again, it's a little bit late now in terms of the fact that it's, we're uh, halfway through June is we say, make sure that you're raising what you're going to eat. Um, so we really, as Beth mentioned, we raise a lot of potatoes. We eat a lot of meat and potatoes, which is you know, for most men, it's, uh, we like it's it that pretty way. Nice. That's right. But uh, we will grow a ton, at least a ton of potatoes uh, because we know that we're going to eat. That's our staple. Uh, we we're still eating last year's potatoes now, and we won't, you know, until when we go on to new potatoes, the other hundreds of pounds that are still in this root cellar will become pig food. 
but we never, 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 never run out of potatoes. But we, we, so we grow a lot of potatoes. We grow a lot of tomatoes. We grow onions. We grow garlic. We grow things that we eat. We are not growing things that we say, oh, we can sell that. Uh, we are going to have an abundance. And we've got a wonderful thing called our locally called grocery box, where this is an online thing. And John would know more about this than we do. But right. this, is a, like a this is an online thing where we can at any time, any week, we can say we have this much to sell. And then we take it in on, uh, then it's sold online and we bring it in on Saturday and drop it off and then they come and pick it up. So it is, uh, it's like Airbnb, we do have an Airbnb, but it's like Airbnb that- For the uh, gardener. For the gardener. And that way I don't have to go to a farmer's market and sit around. It's already sold. I know exactly what's sold uh, and I can put out what I want. And if I've got, if I'm short one week, then I don't have to put it out as much, but I can put up, but it is coming from our abundance. Um, we are not trying to raise what we to to raise, to raise food money. To sell. That's right. We do sell food, but it's always surplus from what we raised for us. Yeah, I'm looking at you, John. So, before we started homesteading, I lived in Louisville, and the way I ended up in the homesteading farming side of things is because we started a, f a food buying club back in Louisville in 2006. So Louisville whole life. And, um, you know, we, my uh, then fiance, we met when I was in seminary, Jessica, who's now my wife. Um, we were as standard American as you can possibly imagine when we first met. So we ate at Wendy's, shopped at Walmart, Kroger and Sam's club. Um, and, and basically through some significant health issues I developed, we went down the rabbit hole to where you find us today. Um, and so when we first started changing the way we ate, um, we started shopping at local farmer's markets. And then we did a CSA. Well, first we started shopping at um, Wild Oats when it existed and Whole Paycheck. Um, and then, you know, we started shopping at the farmer's market and then we bought a uh, CSA share and then we took the real gateway drug of uh, herd share and a dairy cow for raw milk for our family. And we went from being able to go to the grocery store one day a week or one and a half days a week to get what we needed. And now it's like, OK, I have to pick up my CSA share on Tuesday and the raw milk farmer delivers on Thursday. And the one farmer's market I like is on Saturday mornings because that has the, these two good farmers for these items. But then we have to also, and I'm just like, this is, this is food should not be this complicated. Uh, I, I should not have to go five to, and we were still having to go to the grocery store as well for a few things. I'm like, this, this is not sustainable for a family. Um, and so Jessica had a cousin in Iowa and she's like, oh, you know, my one cousin in Iowa, she has a food buying club. Maybe we could do this. And I looked at Jessica and I go, absolutely not. Um, this is crazy. So because we we're getting ready to move for, to Canada for me to do Ph.D. work. Um, and you see how well that worked out. Like, it worked out really well because I have six wonderful children instead and a 35 acre farm. Um, so it was the best deal I ever made. But eventually we started a food buying club, which was basically a way for us to consolidate a bunch of good farmers and suppliers into a system for transportation and distribution. Um, so I always tell people, you know, starting, starting local alternative food distribution systems is one of the very best things we can do. Um, one, one, one thing that I would add to that is that if you, uh, somebody had asked us about how, how do I get good food? And I said, well, you know what you could do is you find a farmer who you trust and you say to that farmer, I want you to raise me food. And then you pay that farmer well to do that. And even with these buyers clubs, you need to pay these farmers well so that they will continue to do this thing for you. Uh, it is not easy Sheep work. Food is very short-sighted because yeah. if you pay a farmer to raise you the best and you're paying him uh, barely a, more a than bare, Walmart, yes, a, a poor living, he will not keep doing it. <laughs> if you want him to be there long-term, 
you have to, you as consumer have to have the attitude. If he's not living as comfortably as I am, oh, I'm not talking, you know, like if you're a doctor, he needs a doctor's income, but if he's not living comfortably and able to rejoice in what he's doing, as I rejoice in the food he's making available to me, well, that's a short road to not having it there. So well, fine club. Yeah. Well, Excellent. one thing you all would like is when I started the club, I, I only had two primary goals. Um, and one of them was I was looking at the USDA food dollar um, data. So if you've ever seen the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, tracks how much money a consumer spends, a farmer actually gets. Yeah. Right. And it, it's crazy the first time I saw this back around 2004, but it's anywhere from around 12 cents to 18 cents right. on the dollar. Right. And that sounds to me as though it's slanted in favor of the ones who get more, because there are a lot of things where the farmer gets less than that, even if it's coming to him in the form of subsidy checks. Yeah. And, and so one of the basic principles of our club was um, our suppliers now for 16 straight years get 75 to 80 cents on the dollar of what our members spent. That's marvelous. That's fabulous. Um, because as you said, it's just like this doesn't work if the money doesn't actually go to the farmers. Because in our current food system, the money goes all to all the middlemen. The money goes to the grocery right. stores right. and it goes to the processors and it goes to the distribution right. centers and the farmers are left paupers. <laughs> um, and that's one reason we need to um, chip away at this uh, you know, hierarchical food distribution system that puts so many needless steps between us and those who feed us. And, and the consumer needs to say, but I can't afford to do that. And, and our suggestion would be is you can't afford not to do this. Mm -hmm. If food really is medicine, which we really believe it is, if you're going to be way healthier because of the way that you eat, which again, we absolutely believe this is what you need to do. If you're not raising your own, you need to pay somebody well to raise your food for you. Well, and you know, th this, um, another piece of data. So what percentage of their income do modern Americans spend on food? Well, it's around 15%, which is just pathetic. It's, it's actually the last time I looked at the numbers, it's more like eight. Wow. Um, wow. You know, especially, I think that's especially if you subtract out entertainment based food buying. Right. I was leaving the <laughs> entertainment based food in there but half of the half of the price there is not for the food. It's for yeah. the convenience or the or the thrill. Yeah. Do you know what the historical world average is? Well, the European the number thing. is between 20 and 40% depending on where you're looking. Yeah. But the historical yeah. world average is going to put almost all of a person's energy into the project of being fed now and staying fed in the future. Yeah. That's what it's, human beings have worried about. Yeah. You know, but but in, in cultures where you had people that were making money to buy food, it's around 30% mm -hmm, of their net income ha has for basically most of human history and most places in the world until very recently gone to food. And so I always tell people, I'm like, you know, right now you might be spending 8%. Even if you double that, you're well below what even what your great grandparents were having to allocate budget wise on food. And, and I'm like, you don't need Netflix. Um, you, you, there, there's so many, <laughs> so many things in your budget you really don't need, but you really do need good food. Right. Right. We and, could and, go down that forever. <laughs> the whole question of yeah. like, are you actually impoverished or are you presently living, um, on a higher level than your income will, will support in these other parts of your life and then neglecting the food end of it. And is it worth fixing that problem? And I think, Amy, you can speak to this. There's been a huge uptick in people suddenly thinking very seriously about not just how safe is my food or how tasty is my food or even how healthy is my food, but how secure is my right. food? I think yeah. that's a good movement. <laughs> Or yeah. will there be vaccines in my food? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's right. a big right. one. Yeah. And so that's a question too. So, um, John, I do want you to tap into a little bit more of like how, how the club works 
Um, and I know there's probably some people wondering, like, how do I start a club? You know, there are there are those go getter homesteaders out there. Um, but, you know, that's that was one of the questions, too, is, OK, I, I'm not growing all of my own food, but how do I know what to buy at the store? You know, just because it has a non GMO label on it or organic doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, And so a lot of people are tending to go towards, um, the farmer or other homesteaders in the area. And so, um, you know, how, what, what's the best way, you know, we, we, a lot of people know about CSAs, um, but kind of explain what, what is your, your club and then how you're, you don't have it in Virginia, right? It's just yeah. Kentucky, Ohio, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they wanted to start one, um, obviously now would be the time to do it. <laughs> uh, how, how would they go about doing that just to understand it more? Yeah. I mean, our club um, was a really simple idea. So when I realized that I wanted to help people access nutritious food, The second thing I realized is that I could not do that in the regulated government approved food system. Um, You know, the the, the government approved food system, its very last goals are healthy foods that farmers are fairly paid for. Um, So I'm sitting here, I'm going, well, I need a way to do this where I will not end up in jail. Um, Cause I look terrible in stripes and I don't want a cellmate named Bubba, um, <laughs> you know? And so how can I do this? So when I started my club, um, it's basically operates very similar to a PMA, a private member association. So you become a member of the club. And the other thing we did with the club um, that when the state of Kentucky finally raided us uh, back in 2011, Um, And that really, really annoyed them is we don't sell things to people in the buying club. Um, We provide a service to people where when you become a member of the club, you open an account with the club and you put your money in that account. And then you say to us, hey, I want raw milk and I want grass fed beef and I want all of these other items and we go get them for you with your money. Um, and, and brilliant, you see, John, brilliant. Um, so well, again, I, I, I just, you know, pinstripes, jail, not getting to cuddle with right, my right, wife right, at night, right, you right. know, um, self-preservation is a, it, it, you know, we talked about this, you, Joel, and I did Amy a couple months right. ago, but this would be great to do another one. You know, a lot of people in America do not realize that from the early two thousands through about 2014, the government raided dozens and dozens of farmers and food buying clubs, you know, Rossum in California, right. uh, hippie food co-op was raided with guns drawn. Um, you know, there's a farmer here in Kentucky that, uh, already, as you all may know, um, Oaks, Gary Oaks, he was, uh, basically, you know, attacked by a, a SWAT team. Yeah. Yeah. There was one in Michigan, just like that. Yeah, you, you know, so, um, yeah, so, so the buying club, you know, and, and then we just, we approach farmers, we approach companies we really want to work with, and we just say, hey, we want to work with you. Um, and we build relationships with local and regional suppliers to fill the product uh, desires, the food desires of our members. And then, you know, there's all the logistics of running a, you know, doing that on the backside. Um, so if people are really interested in this, um, I've had so much interest in this the past few years. Back in like 2014, I wrote a little booklet. And then at the last Rogue Food Conference in Florida, because um, I just don't have time to rewrite the booklet right now, I did a three-hour seminar to kind of update the booklet on what I'd learned in the additional almost decade of running our food buying club. Um, you know, but it really just comes down to finding interested people who want to get similar quality food and products that you do and banding together to make that happen. So let's get this straight. They raided you, but they couldn't do anything with it because of the fact that you are simply 
an agent for somebody who is spending his own money for a product he can legally access himself, just yeah, not necessarily yeah. through, through uh, not through a middleman. Yeah, you know, so they raided us, they served us with cease and desist and quarantine orders. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the very, very scary. If, if you violate this, you will be given a fine of not less than this, and you will have not less than this many days of jail time. Um, and, and, you know, th that's one of those memories, like family memories, because we had, um, I think Noah was pretty little at the time. So I have two little kids and then a very, very little kid. And you finally get to ask yourself the question, um, will I really go to jail <laughs> over who gets to decide what I feed my family? Because um, I, I, Joel and I quoted this to Amy, but just for since there might be different people today, um, the government was sued over the interstate ban on the transport and sale of raw milk. Mm -hmm. And in that lawsuit, the government said, that there is no fundamental right to choose what you eat and feed your family. Um, and, and, and there's been numerous times the government has said this, both at the federal and certain state levels. The, the government's view is we're the final arbitrator of what you can eat or not, um, which is terrifying. Yeah. You know, just like it's terrifying with some other subjects we could um, Absolutely. rabbit trail down into right. and Absolutely. we'll avoid. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when they raided us, um, they were, you know, we partly won because of how I had set up the organization. Mm -hmm. But the biggest reason we, we won is, um, so, you know, they leave these cease and desist and quarantine orders. Mm -hmm. And I basically reached out to our then 120 members at that time. And I'm just like, hey, you know, um, you all, you all really are who have the choice here. Um, you will decide whether or not the government gets to decide what you can eat and who you can get food from. And if you agree with me that that's not a power the government has or should have, then we're all going to break this cease and desist and quarantine order together. Okay. Um, and so we had over a hundred some people together break the cease and desist and quarantine order. And that really put, you know, between the way we were legally structured and then we had a very strong community, it really created a problem for the Kentucky Health Department. Because they're not just putting John in jail anymore. Because if they tried to put just me in jail, when I appear before the judge, my lawyer's going to say, where are the other 99 people who also broke the cease and desist and quarantine? Mm -hmm. And then the state's attorney is going to have to make up some shady excuse why they're only going after me that the judge isn't going to accept. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a big part of us winning as well, as we just have such an amazing membership. That's in our marvelous. buying club. Right. Well, and I think that goes back to something, you know, to draw out a line that you were um, extending already, that question, making connections with local people and um, building up relationships for all those people who can't say, look, um, I have the land and the knowledge or, or at least uh, some basic instructions for how to make my own food sourcing secure. And that's, a, that's the mo most of the country can't say that right now. But for those people, we would suggest there are ways to begin to make the kinds of, form the sorts of relationships John is talking about, whether or not you start a buyer's club or join a buyer's club, um, simply by um, inhabiting your space in a way that's a little bit more conspicuous and intentional. Uh, our, our own local healing land group is really mostly just about that. It's about who, who lives here? What do we do? How can we share? How can we help one another? What can I teach you? What can you teach me? What, what skills can, right. Well, That's right. How can we teach each other how to butcher? How can we teach each other how to do those things that uh, homesteaders have been doing for a very long time. And those skills have been lost in the last uh, generation or two. And that's really just a grassroots effort, just like the space we're in right now. This is obviously not our house. It's a lot. Our house looks very different. This is the studio for the new polity, which is a, I don't even know how to characterize a new polity, but it's 
part of sort of a local tempest in our tiny rundown, um, um, economically depressed little town of people who hold street fairs once a month. And look, people, we're happy to be who we are. We're happy to share that with anybody who wants to have fun. And as John says, if there are 100 people doing something that the government doesn't really like, they're going to have a hard time getting us all in jail. Right. I think that's really important too. Um, and I'm glad that you guys brought that up because that's what H2A has always been about is mm-hmm. building a community and right. connecting you to your community. And then, you know, you go back to your that's community right. and exactly. you start doing this. You know, we get <clears throat> emails every week. Well, could you come to this state? Could you come to that state? Okay. No. How about you come here that's right. and then you go back to your state and you do it and, that's and right. you build your community. And, um, you know, I posted, on Instagram yesterday, how, in my opinion, we've been so distracted about fixing the current system that's broken when really we should be throwing time into creating a new system that's, that's here, right. on here. Our, you know, here. and it's here, right, it's just right. a waste of time. And so, and so we're doing that, you know, and there's these little pockets of communities, you know, they're not weird. That's not a hoo-ha thing. As Joel says, you know, it's, it's just friends and family. Okay. I'm going to grow this. You do this. Uh, I've got the cow. You can't grow the cow. So I'll grow the cow, you know, and it, you create these little bubbles of, um, communities that can help. And it's the greatest way to shorten that supply chain. Um, you know, we we're seeing a lot of that with extended families where it's mm-hmm. so exciting to see grandma and the younger kids and, and they are sharing those skills together and, and farming together. And right. Just, yeah. just this year, we've worked with a number of that sort of grouping who have either come to us for instruction or have had us to their farm. But we're seeing it just pop up. Amy, you you must have just had a sense that this was coming because HOA came into being about two years before this became critical. Right. But haven't you noticed like the last two or three years, it started before COVID, mm-hmm. this spike, not in interest. There's been, I mean, we're in our, we're around 60, right? And we've been doing this a long time. There was interest back in the eighties and the seventies. This is guts. This is people who are now finding the guts to say, oh, this is important. And I wanted to say, when we were driving here, I was thinking something I want to say is for all of you wonderful HOA people out there, this is a a ton of this has a question, has to do with, it's a question to do with priorities. Um, It has so far been easier for most Americans to say, yeah, food's important. Exercise is important. God is important. All those things are important, but and I come from this, so I I own this, right? This is where I came from. Probably 98% of my energy should go into my money making job. Um, You know, that's how we think. And I feel as though America is looking into its own heart and finding the guts to say, where my heart is, my treasure will be, where my treasure is, where my heart will be. And I need to really commit time. This will not happen for anybody, guys unless you make it important. This is not going to happen with your, this is not going to fill the time that presently you're spending maybe at the gym, right? This is going to be a life changing commitment. And and Walmart and all of those big corporations are not going to solve this problem. I mean, Mm -hmm. they are not, it's not going to be that somehow they do that. It is going to be us doing it. And, and the thing that we have found is that when we work together as a family, our family is bonds together in really it's wonderful ways and people say to us when they see us work together you guys really work like a team um i and hope so th- yeah and that's really it's totally worth it isn't it yeah isn't it totally worth it yeah 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 we had this conversation too a few weeks ago on social media you know we were um of course me being a woman i'm big into the homemaker community too and and i had said um you know, we always talk about women being at home, but the industrial revolution took men away from home. And, you know, we were all home at one point working the farm and, and growing food and preserving. It wasn't just the woman canning, the man was there too, you know? And so it's, 
I, we see this mindset that's shifting now. Um, and and I think after 2020, yeah, I think some of it is that we no longer look at money as the solution to all things, because if money is the solution, then one of the family members, or maybe both of the family members going off and bringing in as much money as you can, that will solve all of our problems. Mm -hmm. And I think we are beginning to see that that does not solve our problems, but that time together working together we can solve i mean we can provide for ourselves and god made god made a beautiful sensible universe that was made to take care of us we just have to learn its nature and and learn its honor pattern. that yeah yeah well and it's it's crazy when you realize um not only does one or both spouses not working not solve the problems but it, it makes so many other problems unsolvable. You know, yes. you know, when both spouses work, who has time for political engagement locally? Right. But, you know, there, there's so many of our modern problems flow out of the industrial revolution fracturing the nature of a household, right. which is a man and a woman having a joint mission together that requires the addition of more men and women, a, a labor pool to, you know, th- th- there is just this beauty in the way households are, are, the, are the backbone of everything else. But here, before, here. before this, before we started, John, you and I, we were talking about, we have eight children. John has six children. His oldest is 16. Our oldest is 35. And what we are seeing now is the incredible reaping of benefits that comes from uh, our older children now, the payback, not payback, but the, yeah. the great value as they have these incredible skills that they learned as children. They've gotten better at all of the things that they do better than we do. And now we are able to uh, work with them and it is, uh, it, it's There's a huge fabulous. message of hope in that because aren't yes. we all sitting here partly because we have this sense or we started out with this sense that what, we, what the culture was offering us was not adequate and it shouldn't be, hopefully wasn't all there was. And then, you know, you, you realize at some point to your grief that really um, we live in a very fractured and diseased culture and as it, you know, for young people now running into that, that can be a, a very discouraging feeling. But there's a huge message of hope in the fact that um, good choices in farming, in food, in family, they all have to do with honoring the nature of how these things were created. And if you do that, it's just like those cows that we buy that have been on grain, but we put them on grass, we take good care of them. And they go back to, they go back to the way they were created to be. That's right. And, Families and, return to, that's right. you know, the nuclear family spreading out into the community and families knitting together into villages. It's hugely encouraging. To Every see that family it can start over. Mm-hmm. We can all start over and do it a different way. We are not locked into anything. We are not locked into our culture that we can say, I, I, I want to find a different way. And, and it, it does start with the family. And Homesteaders is, is the online village where that's happening more here than anywhere else we're seeing it. Right. Awesome. <clears throat> <laughs> I've kept you guys for an hour and a half. <laughs> it's been a delight. And I know we could have another hour of this conversation, but I am so grateful for all of you joining us, Sean and Beth and John. It's been great. Um, I, I'm going to let you go. I will uh, say John, um, John and I did a live stream with Joel a couple months ago now, I guess, mm-hmm. um, where we do go in depth on, on the raids. And we were talking about, um, uh, a man in Pennsylvania who got raided uh, for his raw milk. And uh, that was a really great conversation too. You guys can go back and watch that on our YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about that, um, that was probably another hour and a half long conversation, I think. Um, but there's a lot of good information in there too, about building community and um, government overreach was really what that, yeah. that conversation yeah. was about. So Uh, All right. Do you guys have any last words to add? If not, we'll get off here. Uh, Here's what I want to add. Amy, you are special. 
No. You are really doing wonderful work with what you're doing. That's always the response that we get from you is, oh, it's not me. I'm, you know, and that that humility is authentic, but it is also uh, you need to know what a good work you're doing. Well, thank you. That is yeah. very encouraging. Yeah. It is. And I'll I just want to say, oh, go ahead, John. I was just say how much I appreciate all of you. So getting to be part of the HOA community. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Well, I just want to say cows rule. <laughs> <laughs> they do. You're convincing everyone to buy milk, just so you know. Everyone. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. All right. Well, everyone watching, thank you so much for um, joining us. We will try to go back and put links in the description over the next week or so. Uh, if you have any questions, you can join the HOA Facebook community group or you can comment in the um, video and we'll try to get to those as well. And we will see you next time. Thanks, y'all. Okay.